Welcome to Cover to Cover Bookbeat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. As we record this on July 16th, it is the 79th anniversary of July 16th, 1945. The date, the world's very first nuclear weapon was detonated in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Those of us who are younger than 79 have grown up in the shadow of that threat. And nearly eight decades later, what is the current nature of that threat? Well, there's no one better to answer that than our guest today. She is New York Times bestselling author, investigative journalist, and Pulitzer Prize finalist, Annie Jacobson. Her career spans numerous media formats, including as a contributing editor at the Los Angeles Times Magazine, writing and producing TV series, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan. She's a graduate of Princeton University, where she was also captain of the women's ice hockey team, the latest book is Nuclear War, A Scenario. It is not a comforting book, rather a wake-up call that we all need to hear. I'm very pleased to welcome Annie Jacobson. Thank you for having me. Were you always going to be a writer? Always going to be a writer. I'm one of those people who knew at a very young age that I was born to tell stories. Uh, was there a specific event or a series of events that led you to start writing this book? You know... Um, I have written about nuclear weapons in all of my previous books as a national security journalist who writes about war and weapons and security and secrets. And in all of those books, nuclear weapons were always touched upon because, of course, so many of the CIA's and the Pentagon's operations over the decades have been, as my sources would say, to prevent nuclear World War Three. And during the last administration of former President Trump during the fire and fury rhetoric, you may recall, I began to wonder what happens if deterrence fails, if prevention fails. And I took that question to the highest level nuclear command and control sources that I could locate to go on the record with me. And the result is this book. It's amazing the access that you had. Were you surprised about that? I was. I was. And looking back, I can attribute it to the to two facts, which I think are interesting, given where we are today. One had to do with the fact that I did a lot of my report, a lot of my interviews for the book during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so people found themselves and most of the officials that I speak with are retired and they found themselves. All of us found ourselves with a little more time on our hands, and perhaps even a desire for a little more human communication. And so those Zooms were a refreshing, you know, moment in my own life, and perhaps in the life of those Cold War warriors, which many of them called themselves. And I think the second fact had to do with the fact that at the time, many of them said to me, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm glad you wrote this book because people have forgotten about nuclear war and its threats. Mm -hmm. This was before the war in Ukraine, and this was before nuclear saber rattling that we hear today sure. was in the in the um, the general public. And so, boy, have times changed in just a few years in terms of what I perceive as a grave threat level ratcheting up. Were there times during the research that you felt that you were being steered towards certain answers or away from certain subjects? Well, that is, of course, the job of the reporter, the job of the investigative journalist. I All of my books go right up to the razor's edge of what can be known by the public because I write about, often write about information programs that were formerly highly classified. And nuclear weapons, nuclear war games are among the most classified secrets in the government mm -hmm. for a very good reason. Um, or rather, I should say, often for a very good reason. And so you use your skills as you get older as a reporter to learn delicately how to ask questions that make your sources feel comfortable sharing things with you. Of course, none of these individuals you're talking to, if you're talking to a former secretary of defense, <laughs> he's not going to break his security clearance, nor is anyone. A Q clearance is what you have when you work with nuclear secrets. But I work with my sources 
right off the bat from what I call the Eisenhower principle. And it, and it goes like this, if I may, you know, everyone knows about Eisenhower's famous military industrials complex speech, which he, in which when he retaught, when he, his last night as president and he spoke to the world and he said, you know, he warned the world and particularly Americans of the grave dangers of the military industrial complex. This idea that we were just making weapons, making more weapons and to have more weapons. And, but in the latter part of that speech, he said something that is often overlooked that I share with my sources, which is the guiding principle for me. Eisenhower also said that it was an alert and knowledgeable citizenry that could balance out the military industrial complex. And that is what I do. I help the public become more alert and more knowledgeable, hopefully, through the books that I write. Well, I have to say that the amount of research on this particular one is absolutely spectacular. And I, I love some little touches. There, there are a few um, Easter eggs in there for those of us who read yeah. deeply. Uh, like you talk about Omaha, one of the one of the major defense areas in the United States, and you also mentioned that it's the birthplace of the pink hair curler and butter brickle ice cream. Where are you found that? I have no idea, but I love that. Well, you know, you asked me earlier if I always knew I would be a, a writer, and the answer I told you was yes, because these are the kind of things I, the narrative thinking that is just the way I am, you know. I interview mostly scientists and engineers and technicians, and that is not how I think. I am not a science thinker. I am a narrative thinker. And so, of course, when I'm realizing and researching wh what a, you know, one or more megaton bomb on a certain city is going to do scientifically, because those are the, those are the facts and figures I get from sources and from the defense department. And when I say scientifically, I mean, you know, how people become incinerated and turn into combusting carbon details like that, which are just horrific in their detail. And the same token, I want to know, my mind immediately says like, what was Omaha, Nebraska before it was incinerated? And then you just do a little reading on the origins of that particular place and you come across details like you mentioned. And for me, it brings it all back to the human element of all of this, which is really, I believe, the only way any of us are going to avoid nuclear sort of Armageddon, if you will, is by going back to the origin of all this, of like, we're the people who created this problem. Nuclear weapons are a man-made problem. The threat of nuclear annihilation is a man-made problem. There were once 70,000 nuclear warheads on the planet. There are now 12,500. That is a movement in the right direction. That can be solved by humans. But the way in which we are going with, you know, enmity against our enemies, ratcheting up and threaten, threatening one another with weapons of mass destruction. This is madness. It is. And I think if you add the political trend to move away from uh, democracies into strongman governments, it does not help that at all. It certainly doesn't. And it's a, it's a point of my reporting style that I'm probably most, um, I'm most content with, which is that I leave politics out of all of my books. I, you do not know how I vote. I write about POTUS, President of the United States, and the decisions that he and his office make and how it affects the rest of us Americans. And as a result, because I don't, or I work pretty hard not to have a public opinion about politics, it has allowed me to have not just readers on both sides of the aisle, but sources. And so, and for example, I can do book events. I recently did a book event in Washington, D.C. at Politics and Prose with a member, like two, two gentlemen that were kind of in that, you know, essentially we had a Q&A with the audience. One of them, John Wolfstall, was one of President Obama's national security advisors on nuclear weapons. The other was Lieutenant General Charles Moore, 
who, in addition to being a fighter pilot, in addition to being inside that bunker, the nuclear command and control bunker I talk about, beneath the Pentagon, he was in there for much of his career. And then he was the deputy commander of Cyber Command. General Moore was on the sitting there with me too. And the three of us had this very lively, very, I thought, significant conversation about the complex conundrum of deterrence. And these are two people who would essentially be on two different sides of the aisle, never mind politically, but one of them in very pro disarmament and the other one very much involved in nuclear command and control. That, that's amazing. You do make the point in the book as well. You share that with us that because you do that, you can you get the, you have the flexibility to talk with people of all different beliefs. Uh, some of the things I noticed now being a, a child of the 50s and 60s, remembering the Cuban Missile Crisis as a young teenager, whatnot. I'm wondering if there isn't some sort of national fear that those of us who are, are a boomer uh, generation want to repress now because there were frightening times when the fire sirens would go off. We were all worried at the time and hid and we practiced the hide under your desk to protect us from nuclear warfare. Um, it was crazy time. I think you've hit the nail on the head about the psychological phenomena that underpins deterrence, which is this idea that more nuclear weapons make us more safe. That is how we have gotten into the bind that we are in. Or you could say that's how we have not had nuclear war for all these decades. And so it is a complex problem and the solution will not happen overnight. What you speak of, I believe, is why so many of the Cold War warriors that I spoke with, they were working on those systems in when you were talking about being a teenager and they were they were you know they were developing the arsenals because the thinking was the only thing that will keep us safe from the russians who want total war with us is the ability to have total war with them and so this you know kind of nuclear threat dueling went on for decades it does exist it does underpin the whole system the real question is how to unwind it in a manner that adds security to the world, doesn't take away from it. One of the things that those of us who are on the West Coast don't have a real grasp of, say, Washington, D.C. geography. And when you mention that the Pentagon is only a few hundred feet away from Arlington National Cemetery, for some reason that strikes home that if a bomb goes there, it isn't just the military is going to be taking out. It's our heritage, it's our control and command, a whole bunch of other things. Well, you learn, I mean, our our heritage becomes, you know, dust in a second. And that is what is so shocking. When I did an interview with the former commander of STRATCOM, and I think readers will be amazed to learn what STRATCOM is, and then even more amazed that they probably didn't know most readers, that is, what STRATCOM was before they read this book, because the STRATCOM commander is the steward of all the nuclear weapons. In the event of nuclear war, it is he who speaks directly with the president. And when I was doing an interview with um, General Keeler, the former STRATCOM commander, we were discussing what a full-scale nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States would look like. And he said to me, Annie, the world could end in the next couple of hours. And you report that in the book, which is one of those frightening things that uh, we should tell people that the book actually explores a total scenario, as, you, as the title suggests, of a nuclear war starting and what happens all the way through that with an increasing escalation. And it is absolutely absorbing reading. That is something you must have fact-checked a zillion times. Well, I take the reader from nuclear launch, that first fraction of a second when our satellite system sees the hot rocket exhaust on the back of an ICBM. That's how nuclear command and control is set up. It begins that quickly. An ICBM cannot be redirected or recalled. And then I take the reader very quickly in three acts through this, you know, minute 72 when everyone's dead and nuclear winter begins and 5 billion people die. And yes, absolutely. As a reporter, you're constantly 
you know, learning these facts, being astonished by them, and then double fact checking them, getting other sources to go on the record. You know, I would learn things from a scientist with the Federation of American Scientists, Hans Christensen, who would give me statistics about like, I'll tell you one shocking example, maybe leave the readers with this harrowing thought that um, our ICBMs do not have enough range to target North Korea without flying over Russia. I learned that from Hans Christensen and it just seems, and he's with, you know, the Federation of American Scientists, so he can't get his facts wrong, but you have to double check that. And I, because what would happen, and as I explained in my, in the scenario that I write, that would, that causes the decision tree problem that occurs as a result is that Russia would almost certainly believe that those ICBMs were coming for them. And when you add into the mix that our current president has not spoken to the current president of Russia in more than two years, you can't really argue, no, they have a great relationship. They'd get on the phone and have a discussion. More than likely, they wouldn't even be able to contact one another. And so when I learned that information, I had to fact check that information. You cannot get that wrong. And I asked Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta to confirm that with me. And when he said yes, that is a very serious problem. You know, one's jaw drops and you put that in the book and then you let readers learn that information. There's so much retail stuff in here that I would say that uh, your relationship with the Tom Clancy universe has either helped or the people who love that will absolutely dig into this book. And there's so many frightening things. One of the things I wanted to ask about is you talk about the current operational plan that directed against just four identified adversaries, Russia, uh, China, uh, Iran, and North Korea. As that number of potential adversaries grows, doesn't the whole problem ex increase in exponentially? It sure does. And, you know, we have nine nuclear, the world has nine nuclear armed nations in the moment. And with Iran about to have the bomb, that makes 10. And these are very serious problems. The very few people are, seem to be paying attention to this. I mean, for example, the White House is supposed to report to Congress by law on the status of Iran's nuclear program. And yet the White House has failed to do that for over a year, the current administration. Well, why have they failed and why is no one paying attention? You tell me. But this is a true fact. And it was reported just the other day in the Wall Street Journal again. The point being is when people have such a focus on partisan issues, on cultural issues, I believe it is to their own detriment not to pay attention to the issues, the existential threats that affect all of us. That's why I wrote Nuclear War Scenario. What do you hope the readers take away from when they close the book? The nuclear war is insane. It's madness. You know, every single one of my sources told me that, literally or figuratively. And the idea that this is a problem that can be solved by humans is also very true. But who is paying attention? That's the question. And that's why I wrote the book. I hope people read the book and are perhaps scared into action the way that interestingly, when I was a kid in high school in the eighties, uh, there was a TV, scene, TV movie on ABC called The Day After, and it scared the crap out of me. And, you know, I was just a high school student, so there was nothing for me to do. But at the time, President Reagan was one of the people who also had the bejesus scared out of him. And he changed his position on nuclear weapons as a result of that. And that is why he reached out to Gorbachev. That's why we had the Reykjavik summit. And that's why we're down to 12,500 nuclear warheads from the 70,000. Change is possible. And it's probably time to watch that again. I remember the most frightening scene was in the countryside watching the ICBMs take off from our and knowing what that meant. I, I want to thank you so much for an extraordinary interview and the extraordinary book, which I think is, should be read by every single American. Our guest today has been the incredible Annie Jacobson. The book is Nuclear War, A Scenario. Thank you so much for an extraordinary interview. Thank you for having me.